Thank you very much, Cesare, for the introduction. Thank you, Ulrike and Stefan, for the kind invitation. I'm happy to be here. And as I said, I, I planned to talk about something you are actually using. This is something called total variation, and you will see what this means, actually. And I will tell you where it's coming from, what's the motivation behind it. And of course, I hope that you will use it more in your image analysis problems. And uh, I also show you how versatile it is and uh, to which kind of problems it can be applied actually. So it's really something quite simple as a model, but very versatile and you can apply it to many different problems. So let's first talk about Bayesian inference. So I guess this is a formula everyone knows. So it's the classical Bayesian theorem, which can be easily derived from the fundamental law of uh, probabilities, the product rule, the sum rule, conditional probabilities. It basically tells you that uh, if you have uh, it's a prior P of U, that gives you, you know, kind of a probability how likely a, a solution U, an unknown solution U is, um, times the likelihood, which connects your unknown solution U with your data F. Uh, and if you want to change the order of f and u, basically the, the Bayesian formula tells you how this computation should be carried out. And it basically tells you that the probability of the unknown solution given your data is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. This p of f is called the evidence, it's just a normalization constant. And this is a, such a fundamental law and um, many different problems, uh, in particular inverse problems, can be solved by means of this formula. And I will give you a very simple example why this formula is so useful. Here I have a simple, but I hope striking example that tells you uh, how important the prior is in the Bayesian theorem. So let's assume we have uh, a disease. We could connect it to COVID or not if you want. Uh, and this is, in this case, it's quite a, a rare disease. So the prior, probability that you're having this disease is very small. You see it's 20 divided by the 10 to the five. And uh, of course, being healthy means one minus the probability of the disease, simple formula. And then assume you have developed a test which can detect the disease with a certain probability, 95% is not so bad. So it means P of T, D means it's a true positive. So the probability that the test is true given you have the disease is 95%. And um, sometimes you have also, you know, uh, false positives and it returns a positive result even for healthy people. And this is 0 0.01, so 1% is wrong. So now uh, the question is what, what is the probability if you take an arbitrary human and test this human and to have the disease given that you see a positive test? What do you think? High or low? 50? Muss ich rechnen. Yeah, do you think it's high or low or something? So, you see, uh, it's low because it's PTD multiplied by PD. Yeah, no? you are, you're right, of course. So, this is the importance of so the prior. Low. Even if the, the test seems to be quite accurate, but since the disease is so rare, mm -hmm. you know. You compute the, as you correctly stated, uh, P of D times P of T given D, and then you have to normalize it. And it actually turns out that it's only around 2%. So you would have a lot of false positives, yeah? Even if the test 95% is not so bad. Yeah. Two percent, yeah? yeah, roughly. Okay, now let's move to images. What is so difficult about images? And uh, the problem with images is that they are, you know, points in a very high dimensional space. Every pixel is a dimension. If you would have a three dimensional space, it means you only have three pixels. So when we have just one pixel, and we assume we have two hundred fifty-six gray values, so this is a standard digital image, then we have nearly 256 different images. If you have a two times two image, four pixels, then we have, as you see, uh, already 4.3 times 10 to the nine different images. This is 
you know, the, the, the border case, which you can still store on your computer. But if we move forward to four times four images, it's already, you know, way too much different images you can generate. And the task in any, you know, image reconstruction, image uh, and uh, denoising algorithm is, you know, to find one of these images and sort out all other images that are not so interesting. And this just tells you that combinatorial, uh, this is a combinatorial problem and you will, there's no way to sort it. So the space is huge and uh, only a really small fraction of images in this space are useful images and correspond to those images you would like to reconstruct. Yeah, if you can put this into contrast into big numbers like the atoms in the observable universe, you know, it's nothing compared to the number of eight times eight images you can construct and so on. So the question is, how does this distribution of, of useful images look like? And when we talk about modeling a prior distribution, we, we would like to have a function that tells us, okay, this image in this huge space, this is a useful image and the others are not. And this can be done with handcrafted models, as I will uh, tell you today, a simple handcrafted model. But of course, su such a prior distribution could also be learned. And it also tells you, uh, since we have so many different images, we will never have the chance to have enough training data even to cover four times four images. So no, no way to have enough training data to really to cover the space. So here's a, a, a simple thing I, I once did, which shows you how could a, a prior distribution on, on, on simple images could look like. So um, let's consider the statistics of small images with two times two pixels. And here you just see a collage of different two times two images. So you see, uh, yeah, it looks almost like noise. And then you can start to analyze the statistics of such small images. And one reasonable approach is that you don't take the intensities as they are, you first make a small transformation. For example, with a discrete cosine transform, so these are um, three of the four basis vectors of the discrete cosine transform. This one gives you a vertical edge, this gives you a horizontal edge, and this gives you kind of a cross edge. And what we are throwing away is the DC component. So the average value of the two times two patch is not so interesting because we assume we would like to be invariant with respect to this. So if you project our patches to those basis images, it basically means we, we compute a correlation to them. Okay, so if, if our two times two patch has a uh, vertical edge, then it has a high response here, a small response here, and a small response here, or a medium response here. And additionally, since we want to visualize the statistics, now this would give us a, a three-dimensional space. We can also uh, normalize the contrast of the remaining vector, saying that the norm of it should be one. And then basically we have a probability distribution on the surface of a sphere in 3D. And if we unroll the surface and visualize the density function of the surface, then we get uh, a function that looks like this. So this is the statistics of two times two images. So this is how it looks like. Simple takeaway for you, it's completely non-Gaussian. So you have heavy tail distribution. You know, you have some peaks here and there. This corresponds maybe to these vertically horizontal edges or diagonal edges and something in between. And this, this part, these lines here correspond basically to rotating the patches. So it's very complicated and uh, I think you can easily extrapolate to saying, okay, if I consider the statistics of large images, four times four, eight times four, it becomes incredibly complex. So what are the basic scientific questions behind that? The Bayesian formula naturally leads to the following questions. So how can we model a priori distributions? What are good parametric models? Should they correspond to convex potentials, non-convex potentials? Should we involve some learning? And once we have a prior distribution and the likelihood, how do we perform inference based on the posterior given by the Bayesian theory? Should we perform maximum a posteriori uh, computation or should we take the expectation or the median or whatever? So these questions are now for years and they are still subject to intense yeah, research and only in a few cases we have good answers. So in general, this, these are unknown questions how to do that. Deep learning, of course, is, 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 is uh, a method that can tackle this kind of problems. For example, to learn prior distribution based on deep learning. We are also doing research in this field, but still uh, we are far away from having good answers. 
let's first about talk about modeling. So I think a Gibbs distribution is something everyone knows quite well here, right? So coming from statistical mechanics. So this is exactly the form of distributions we are using. Does anybody know why it's, it's in general good to have an exponential distribution? Why? Yeah, that's a better, better explanation. It's maximum entropy. So when you're, when you're looking, you have some constraints and you're looking for a distribution that has the highest degree of freedom, maximum entropy, that, uh, you know, doing a Lagrangian approach and sort of a Lagrangian multiplier, you always end up with an exponential. For example, when, you, when you're looking for a distribution with a fixed variance and you want to maximize the entropy, do you know which distribution comes out? In Gaussian. Exactly. Gaussian is the max entropy function. Uh, for fixed variance, but if you have, you know, more constraints, marginals, for example, you would like to, to pre-specify, you always end up with, with exponential distributions. And therefore, it's, it's quite common to make use of this kind of distributions. Yeah, these distributions, they are exponential of minus some energy, and you also have some temperature parameter that basically it can be really related to the variance of the distribution. And in the prior distribution, R of U is usually called the regularization or smoothness term. And in the likelihood, uh, this D of F given U is usually called the data fidelity or data fitting term. And you will see them appearing later. When we write down Bayes' theorem, basically it means adding up R plus D. And this then gives us the energy of the, of the complete distribution. Uh, and up to a normalization constant, of course. This is the mo complete model. So let's first talk about modeling the data fidelity term because this is usually dictated by the application. And it's usually much easier because it takes into account the noise in our system. Uh, and when we talk about linear inverse problems, you usually see that the data we observe is A times U plus N and A is a linear operator. For example, today we talked about computer tomography and MRI. In MRI, for example, A is a pure transform, U is the image to reconstruct, N is some noise, and F are measurements in the case space. In computer tomography, A is a radon transform, U is again the image to reconstruct, and F are the, you know, the sinogram. In image denoising, A is just identity, and you have just noise. In image deconvolution, A is a blur kernel, and so on. So you see many different applications can be cast into this kind of problem. And if you assume that N is Gaussian noise with some fixed variance, IID, maybe so identically independently distributed, then a uh, standard data fidelity term D of e, F given U is just the least squares between A times U minus F. Because AU minus F is N, and you know N is then just you have just a Gaussian distribution on N. Okay, let's talk about modeling and regularization term. And this will finally lead to the total variation. So the total variation is nothing else than a, you know, a particular image prior and the energy appearing in the prior is then the total variation. So what is the idea of a simple prior? First, images are so complicated that uh, it's almost impossible to have a really good prior, but let's talk about uh, one that is very simple. The task of a prior is it should assign a high probability to natural looking images, likely images, and it should assign a very low probability to unlikely images, images with artifacts, images with noise, and so on. The most easiest assumption you can take, and this is the one we are talking about today, is that images are piecewise constant functions. So as you see here, this, this is a quite well-known phantom image used in biomedical image processing. It's the Shep Logan phantom. It should model as cow with some tumors and so on. So this is test image from the 90s, they're still using it. But it's piecewise constant. You see, you have uh, regions that have a constant gray value and then there's a sharp discontinuity to the next. Here you have the bones and so on. But inside each region, it's a constant intensity function. When we start to compute the spatial gradients in X and Y direction, so this is written as nabla U, X gradient and Y gradient, then we plot these two functions here. See, once we have horizontal edges, once we have vertical edges, here we have computed 
the pixel-wise magnitude. But what we see is actually that the gradients are sparse. In most regions, the gradient is zero, and only where the intensity function jumps, there's a gradient. Okay, so the fraction of locations where we have a gradient is relatively small compared to the number of points where there's no gradient. So we can also do some, already do some statistics. What happens if we take uh, this image here and compute a histogram, a normalized histogram, then, you, then we have a distribution. And usually it's, it's better not to visualize the histogram, but to take the negative log of the histogram because then it doesn't show you the distribution, but the energy. So we have exponential minus energy, negative log of the distribution gives us the energy. And what you actually obtain is this black function. It's a so-called heavy tail distribution. It means most locations where the energy is lowest, the gradient is zero, and only there are a few locations where there are gradients. And the classical approach is now, okay, let's fit the parametric function. Let's start with a quadratic function. This would correspond to a Gaussian distribution, exponential minus quadratic, completely off. We see the distribution of gradients in images is completely non-Gaussian. We can take the absolute function, which is closer, or we can take x to the power of 0 0.5, x absolute x to the power of 0 0.25, and so on. And we see, okay, it corresponds to this concave type of potentials. Okay, this is already something, and therefore let's keep this parameter as exponent three. Let's take as an energy uh, yeah, magnitude of the gradient to the power of alpha. And then we see what happens if alpha is 2, 1, 0 0.5. Well, now we have this gradient based regularizer with this exponent here. And what are we doing? We want to have an energy. So we're integrating over the image domain the image gradients magnitude to the power of alpha. Here we have a clean image. And here we are plotting the pixel wise energy. So this R of U just thumbs up all the. the energies around the image uh, is relatively low, as you see here. So it's a dark color, only in a few locations it's high. And if you do, would do the same on a, on a noisy image, then of course we have much more energy. So it, it makes the right job. It has a high energy in, in, in noisy images and low energy in... What is new here? This is just a tuning parameter, which we can use later. It's kind of this variance. You can make it wider or not. This was the modeling. So we talked about modeling the data fidelity term relatively straightforward. We have a simple model for the prior and we will put everything together. But now let's first talk about inference. Inference means using these models in the Bayesian theorem, which you know, image we would like to recover from the base theorem. The base theorem gives us a complete distribution. So it tells us just you know, a probability of a certain configuration between a solution and input data. Okay, so uh, there are basically, yeah, let's say two different ways how to perform inference, but let's first look at different configurations of probability distribution to see what makes sense and what not. If you have a uni model distribution like a Gaussian, then a, a useful thing is just to take the maximum, which in this case is equivalent to the expectation to the mean, right? But uh, when you look at the bimodal distribution, then we see, okay, taking the maximum gives us something with high probability, but taking the mean gives us a configuration with very low probability. So you have to really take care of which kind of distribution you have. And if you have this uh, non-symmetric distribution, we see that they are similar, but not the same. And therefore, usually one considers a general form of a Bayesian estimator. This is formulated as an optimization problem. Here we have the posterior and the so-called loss function that tells us yeah, what, what is so the criterion to optimize in the inference. And depending on which loss function you are, you are uh, picking, you will get a different estimator based on the posterior in your Bayesian theory. So when we um, use the quadratic norm, of the loss function, then this uh, optimization problem would look like this. So it means we look for such an image U that minimizes the weighted quadratic distance to all other images. 
And this is exactly the formulation when you when you derive it with respect to V, set it to zero, you get exact, exactly the expected solution. So the expectation is kind of a weighted average of your uh, probability distribution. And then the formula looks like this. This is usually a very stable Bayesian estimator. It has some problems if you have a multimodal distribution, but in a unimodal distribution, this works very well and is also very stable. Sometimes it can be hard to compute in practice because as you see here, you have to solve a high, uh, you have to compute a high dimensional integral. You have to take your integral over all possible images V and in the very beginning we've seen, we have you know, an exponential number of possible images, so it's impossible. Therefore, you need some important sampling, Markov chain, Monte Carlo algorithms, and so on. The other possibility, and this is the one we will stick to, is to take a zero one loss function. Um, and the zero one loss function, it tells you zero if u and v are the same, and if u and v are not the same, it returns one. Then you have to solve this optimization problem. And the thing is, this function here is minimized exactly for that u which has the highest probability, because then you basically leave out that one with the highest probability here in this optimization problem. And then it turns out, okay, we just need to look for that solution u that has the highest posterior. And this is the so-called maximum a posterior estimate. And it is here to see that looking for that u that maximizes the posterior is the same as looking for the u that minimizes the energy by just you know, taking this negative log of your posterior distribution. So the logarithm is a monotone function. So it doesn't change the optimization problem. Then instead of maximizing, you minimize. So you take the negative. So this is something I like to, to show. The, the, the grandmaster in optimization, Leonhard Euler said, nothing in the world takes place without optimization. There's no doubt that all aspects of the world that have a rational basis can be explained by variational methods. So we believe him. So therefore, we stick to this Bayesian inference based on the maximum posterior estimate, means solving an optimization problem. Okay, now we have developed our approach to the point where we need to solve an optimization problem. And according to Euler, this is maybe not a bad uh, thing. And now putting together our prior on the, our data fidelity term. Remember, this was our prior. And we have a data fidelity term, just the, the A matrix here is just identity here. So it's uh, specialized to image denoising. So solving such an energy minimization model, um, or you can also call it aberration model, means computing your first order derivative using the Euler Lagrange equation, setting it to zero, and solve for it. And this is how the formula looks like. And this is a well known problem in, in PDEs or in, in anisotropic nonlinear diffusion and there are quite efficient emerging methods for solving these kind of problems. But we are not so much interested in solving these PDEs here. Uh, I just show you what happens when we apply this model to image denoising using different values of the exponent. Um, here we have a noise image of this monarch butterfly. Uh, when we select alpha equal to two, this was meaning that we fit a Gaussian distribution to the gradients. We have already seen that it's not a good fit, yeah. and this is what comes out. It's very blurry. This is when the exponent alpha is one, looks quite nice. And this is when the exponent alpha is 0 0.5, maybe looks even more crispy, sharper edges. We have already seen it when we compared the histogram that maybe alpha 0 0.5 is not bad. And alpha one is still off, but also works. But there's another thing. When we solve the optimization problem, actually we have to decide if our optimization problem is a convex one or a non-convex one. And it turns out that the optimization problem stays convex as long as alpha is greater or equal than one. Because then we have absolute functions. And as soon as alpha gets below one, then we have you know these concave functions, then we have to solve a non-convex optimization problem. And therefore the trade off which seems to be a, a good solution is to select alpha equal one. It's not a very accurate model, but it's the corner case where the optimization problem to be solved is still a convex one. I guess I, I don't have to tell you a lot about convex versus non-convex optimization. In convex optimization, 
uh, you have the guarantee that when you make the gradient descent, you always reach uh, solution with lowest energy. Doesn't have to be a unique solution, but you always get to the bottom. Whereas in non-convex optimization, depending on your starting point, you can feel trapped in a local minimum or in, in another spurious stationary point. But just the gradient is zero, it could also be a settle point, an arbitrary bad uh, energy value. So therefore, from an optimization point of view, it's always desirable to try to find a convex formulation of your optimization problem. And actually, this is already the total variation. When we select alpha equals to one, so that actually there is no alpha anymore, then the prior we have now developed is the total variation. So it you know, integrates over the image domain just the magnitudes of the image gradient. That's everything. Here I wrote it with the D because, you know, uh, when we think about continuous images with strong discontinuities, really sharp discontinuities, no gradient exists. So therefore we have to treat the gradient in a distributional sense. It's called a distributional derivative. And this is also well-defined if the function has sharp jumps. So the distribution derivative decomposes the derivative in, into a part that is absolutely continuous and smooth and into a part where you have just a sharp jump. And in the regions of the jump, it just measures the height of the jump integrated over the edge. The main advantage of the total variation is, is also we discussed today in the afternoon is that it, when you, you know, minimize it on your image, it preserves sharp discontinuities and in the images, discontinuities are really important. It also has a very nice geometric interpretation. So there really a lot of theory can be developed based on the total variation. Namely, there's something called the co-area formula. When you take this image and you consider the image as a, you know, a, a landscape of gray values, like a, you know, a mountain area, bright values means a high mountain, dark area means a valley and so on. And uh, you have just a map of uh, ISO gray levels, right? This is what you see right here then the value of the total variation is thresholding your image at an arbitrary at all different thresholds that gives you these lines here, taking the length of these lines and integrating it up. So you can decompose the value of the total variation into you know, length of ISO level lines in your image. Why is this important? Consider you, uh, maybe I, I'll tell you this later. If the image is binary, zero or one, then of course uh, they are just, all these lines correspond to the same, then you can measure the boundary length of an object uh, represented as a binary image. And this is exactly what, what, I'm, what I'm having here. Uh, if my image is this binary image and I compute the total variation on a binary image, then the value of the total variation is exactly the length of the shapes represented by the binary images. And when you start minimizing, the total variation means you end up with shapes that have smaller boundary length. So it has a really geometric meaning. So this one would have a large total variation that's you know, almost fractal. And when you start minimizing it, this is medium total variation and this has much smaller total variation because the boundary length of the object is much shorter. So it means you can also use it to regularize binary shapes. Now let's come to the RIF model. This is one that is already used by Marco in, in, in his work for you know, removing artifacts of images. This dates back to famous people in image processing, uh, Rudin, Osha, and Fatime. You know, it has been published in a physics journal <laughs> in 1992, physics D, physical D. And the RIF model is nothing else than combining the total variation with a quadratic data fidelity term. And this is the prototypical optimization problem in mathematical imaging. So in, in this time where I did my PhD, this was the benchmark problem to develop fast algorithms that can solve for this problem. And we developed, for example, primal dual algorithms to solve this model. And when I talk about solving, I always mean that uh, give me some F, try to find the view that minimizes this energy function. And when we minimize the energy function, it's clear it will find a trade-off between a low value of the total variation and still sticking close in terms of least squares to your input data. 
So let's try to apply uh, this ROF model for image denoising. This is a famous guy who knows it. Yes, Chaplin. Very good. This is the noise image, and this is the denoised image with the total reaction. You see, there's no algorithmic development. All I did is I have a prior, I have a likelihood, and I solve for the configuration that has the smallest energy, and I can use an arbitrary numerical optimization algorithm to minimize it, and then this is the result. So maybe in the interest of time, I don't talk too much about the discretization. Maybe just, I guess some of you will be experts even more than I when, when we talk about discretizing PDEs or, or ODEs. Usually what we do is the most simple thing instead of continuous, you know, the river this, we just take final differences, standard approach. When we talk about the discrete ROF model, then it means just, you know, instead of having continuous functions, I have, you know, pixel intensity values and, and my U is maybe just a vector with intensity values and F is also a vector. And then I have this gradient operator, which is just a linear, it's, it's more as a matrix applied to this vector that represents the image. And the total variation then is represented just by a two one norm. The two norm is with respect to the image location where I compute the magnitude of the gradient, which has two components. And the one norm is then the, you know, the integral uh, over the image domain. In formula, it looks like this. So maybe a word for numerical optimization. Um, the problem, why it is a hard optimization problem and why it's served as a, as a benchmark problem is uh, this ferret here. This ferret, you know, in 2D, it's a ice cream cone, has the shape of an ice cream cone, and it's non-continuously differentiable at zero. And the zero will appear very often because this is a region where the image is flat, where there's no gradient. So you cannot use a gradient-based optimization problem because the gradient has a problem here at zero. And therefore, this is something I, I did uh, many years already ago after my PhD to develop numerical algorithms that can also solve these kind of optimization problems, even if they're non-differentiable. And we applied it to a particular class of optimization problem, which is the sum of two functions, f of kx plus g of x. f and g are simple convex functions, not, could also be non-smooth functions in case of linear operator. So it's like, you know, linear programming has a particular form and you develop algorithms, we use this form that uh, has this yeah, particular uh, properties. And I'm not sure how much you are an expert in, in convex optimization. Duality, maybe you know the uh, Le Chandre Fenchel transform, this comes also from physics, when you go from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. When I apply the Lagrange, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Le Chandre transform to f of kx, basically I, I get something like this here, f of kx times y and minus f star of y. And this is then a so-called settled point formulation. So I've turned the minimization problem into a min-max problem, the so-called convex concave settled point problem. And when I go from here to here, it looks like this. And we basically developed an algorithm that can solve this kind of settled point problems. Intuitively, what is this algorithm doing? It makes a gradient descent step with respect to X, followed by gradient ascent step with respect to Y. A ping pong algorithm. But it turns out, uh, based on this transform, you can deal with the non-differentiability. Yeah, maybe I skip over this, not so interesting. So what if we have uh, color images? If you have color images, we don't have a, a just a, gray valued image, we have now, for example, red, green, and blue channels. And now the, the question is, how can we extend the total liberation to such color images? And the approach is quite straightforward. Instead of uh, having just one channel, you have three channels of images, red, green, and blue. And then the gradient is no longer a vector, it's now the Jacobian. You have here the gradient of red, gradient of green, and the gradient of blue. And then it's more or less just about what is the a suitable norm based on, on the Jacobian. And then looking into Wikipedia, let's check which kind of matrix norms do we have. We have the Frobenius norm that looks like this, but then we also have so-called Schatten norms that operate on the singular values of the Jacobian. 
and then depending on, on which exponent you're using, you have the uh, one shot norm, two shot norm, infinity shot norm, and so on. It's really like you, you can just make use of any sort of uh, matrix norms you can find and try out how well they work. The one that really works best is if we choose P here, uh, P equals one here. And then it just means you penalize the sum of the singular values of the Jac Jac uh, Jacobian. And this norm is then the so-called nuclear norm. One of your sorry why is called nuclear? <laughs> I don't know actually <laughs> I've asked myself several times I don't know yeah and here it's just a, a comparison which you didn't know you don't see a lot because of the light what they basically see is that the nuclear norm better preserves fine details but the difference is not it's really not so huge it just says you, you can play around and try out different stuff what you like so one of the shortcomings of RF, and this is something we discussed with Marco, is something called the staircasing effect. If I take this image, I add noise, I denoise it with the total variation. Remember, the underlying principle was a piecewise constant image. So of course, it tries to make this image piecewise constant, and then you see this so-called staircase effect. It's, instead of a ramp, you see a small staircase. And this is really, I mean, it's because the, the ROF model or the, the total variation assumes that the solution is piecewise constant. So it, it tries to squeeze the recovered image into this model. And the question is how can we resolve it? Marco chose the Huber ROF model, <laughs> for example, which basically means that we take the ice cream cone and the tip is rounded. So it means we just replace uh, the, the, the ice cream cone with a quadratic function uh, if the absolute of X is small. Uh, it's less equal than epsilon, so it's the lower part, and the rest just stays the same. We just round the ice tip at the tip, the ice cream cone at the tip. And then we already see that this staircasing effect, maybe you see here, is, is, is reduced. But there's something better you can do, and this is also something we, we developed together with Tristan Predis and Karl Kunisch, which we then termed total generalized variation. Um, and uh, this is a model actually where we extended the total variation to higher order smoothness. And this is how it looks like. So when V is zero, then we exactly the same model as before. Then it's just the absolute of U and this term vanishes. But we have an additional variable V that can compensate for these staircases. And additionally, we say that the gradients of V should be small. So here, actually, I'm writing it exactly how it works. Uh, in smooth regions where we have a ramp, then du can be well approximated by vector field v, and the vector field v itself is constant because it's a, it's a ramp. The gradient is constant along a ramp. And this term forces v to be, again, piecewise constant, and part of du where we are at the ramp can be compensated with the v. And the nice thing, it's still a convex model. So it's just a sum of convex functions. So everything is fine and, and can again be easily minimized. Now let's, let's see at the same test picture how well it works. Same test picture, this is the result of the ROF staircasing and this is the result of TGV and it's almost perfect as you see. Yeah? It is a small artifact that, uh, you know, if from the ramp to the discontinuity, it likes to make it a little bit flatter here. Yeah? But this is the price you have to pay. <laughs> But still, when you look at this image, it looks almost perfect, right? Let's again denoise Charlie Chaplin, and we see that the results are you know, looking a little bit more natural here in this shaded area. So now let's try out a different data fidelity term. And uh, one of the data fidelity terms that works very well in, in case we have non-Gaussian noise, like you know, artifacts or, or Impulse noise or speckle noise is an L1 data fidelity term. So we just replace here the quadratic data fidelity term with an L1 norm. And something you immediately see is that uh, maybe you know that uh, norms are one homogeneous. So you can multiply in and out constants. So if you have a constant inside, you can move it outside. That this model is contrast invariant. So if, if you have an F and you get the solution U, <laughs> now I, I put in a F times a constant. The solution U is the same, again, multiplied with the same constant C. So it's contrast invariant. 
And uh, when we would like now to denoise this image here, this is how it works with the previous model with the quadratic data fidelity term. And this is how it works with the L1 data fidelity term. And something I, I, I like to show when, 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 I, when I'm teaching this is uh, the scale selection property. This is the input image. And when I start to regularize it, so I put a stronger weight on the regularizer, the structures disappear independent of the contrast. So they're like magically can be removed when I increase the strength of the regularization term. Whereas for the ROF model, the structures with the smallest contrast and the smallest structures first disappear. And, and you know, it, it doesn't have this very nice geometric structure. We can also do the same with different data fidelity terms. For example, if you're in, in synthetic aperture radar or in, in, in yeah, SPECT as another image modality in, in medical imaging or ultrasound images, then neither the Gaussian noise uh, nor another noise assumption works well. Usually you know that you have some kind of multiplicative noise so that the noise module you know, is unknown image times noise. Then you can also make use of different data fidelity terms here. It's based on the on, on the entropy. Also works. So you, you have a noise image, and usually you see that in um, in dark regions, it's you know the, the image is much more degraded compared to bright regions. So this you see here, and you see with a standard quadratic data fidelity term, the, the dark regions are completely destroyed and much better preserved with with the entropy here. But this is what I like about this approach. You know what, uh, what is the noise, you know what is the property of your image and you can model it in a systematic way using a Bayesian approach and then select just an optimization algorithm and you get the desired solution. So you can really uh, apply a very nice modeling and you can incorporate physical constraints like in MRI and so on on your model. Okay, so I have many more uh, different applications. Maybe I, I, I will not mention all of them. Uh, maybe I, I'm talking about image segmentation because I know this is an issue also here. Uh, this is basically based on the fact that the total variation, if you have a binary image, measures the length of the boundary. And if you want to have a compact segmentation of our image, basically we can use the total variation in order to regularize also the image segmentation problem. Um, let's assume we have uh, an image I and we have a foreground region and a background region and we have a distribution that tells us how likely is a particular pixel belonging to the foreground and to the background these are these two distributions. Could be a color model or a histogram or whatever or something based on features. Then in our variation approach what we usually take is the negative log ratio. And the negative log ratio will be positive if the image, if the pixel is more likely to correspond to the uh, foreground and negative if it's more likely to correspond to the background or exactly the other way around. I think we have it on the next slide. So if let's check if this P is larger than that one, the negative log should be negative, right? If it belongs to the foreground, yeah, it should be negative. Uh, and then we can again make use of this weighting function, which is the negative log ratio together with our total variation model. But now we would like to have a binary segmentation. So the image is constrained to be zero or one for every pixel. Okay. And for this, we know that the total variation regularizes the boundary length of our segment. If you want to segment an object like a person, we would like to have a, you know, not a fractal segmentation, but a, a smooth segmentation. Okay, uh, this is actually what I tried to say before. Yeah, I think I did it right. If the image is more likely to, to uh, belong to the foreground, then the weighting function is negative. If the pixel is less likely to belong to the foreground, then the weighting function is positive. Yeah. Now there's a very interesting relation. The previous model, this is a non-convex problem because the set over which we are optimizing is non-convex. It's a binary optimization. There's no you yeah, know, continuity between zero and one. So it's a combinatorial hard problem in general. But it turns out that uh, the easiest ROF model can be used to provably solve this 
non-convex optimization problem, this combinatorial problem. Basically, what you do is you take the weighting function, you just denoise the weighting function, you take the result, which is then the V, threshold it at zero, and this is a solution provably of this previous problem. So that's quite a lengthy proof, but you can prove that actually you can solve this combinatorial and P hard problem by means of a continuous convex optimization problem. Here's an example, maybe then it's easier. Here you see the weight function, it's negative means it's, it's, it's zero. Who knows this person? <laughs> I think you've seen my slides, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. And this is, you see, the segmentation you get from that. And uh, the TV means that the boundary is, is regularized. Is, you know, smooth. And then you can use this mask to cut out this person. You can also extend it to multiple regions. And this is also a, a very famous model from physics, the POTS model. Okay, so in the POTS model, you have different regions with different spins. And uh, in the end, uh, this is nothing else than a continuous form of the POTS model. And you can also show a similar result that you can solve this uh, this combinatorial problem by means of a convex optimization problem with this awful lengthy formula here. Um, yes, I think this is an example where we just applied it with 16 different labels and you can nicely segment them this colorful image into 16 different labels, 16 different regions. You can also do interactive segmentation with that. I think here, I think, uh, four different regions, and you can segment them the same object as before into different segments. This is something I like very much, solving the POTS model in 3D, because since we are minimizing the length of the boundary in 3D, it means minimizing the surface area. And if you have ever played around with soap bubble films, you know they are minimizing the surface area. So when you put it, this wireframe here into soap, water then this structure here is formed and you know the, the the surface that has minimal surface area has this small strain in the middle as you can prove and we did it computationally here and actually this uh, sorry approach has exactly found the same solution look here you see then the small square here in the middle if you if you can see but the same yeah, it's not so now you should see it. It's hard to render it. So I asked my colleagues to render it, but it's very hard to render. But we were able to recover exactly the same solution as the nature gives us with this approach. Okay, so maybe something in the end. I talked about MRI reconstruction. In MRI reconstruction, we know that we are acquiring measurements in the K space, the Fourier domain. And with the inverse Fourier transform, we can only then uh, get the image. And in order to speed it up, MRI, we do a subsampling. So it, it means we are not taking every line in the case space, maybe only every second. And then this leads to artifacts, and, and uh, then this needs regularization. Additionally, in parallel images, also something we, we discussed today in the afternoon, uh, we have different receiver coils, and every receiver coil is sensitive in a particular region of the image domain. And now we can set up, uh, you know, an energy functional based on total variation regularization plus the data fidelity term that makes use of this model with the Fourier transform and the sensitivities. And this already dates back to 1999, Fussmann. Uh, actually, where the linear operator A that appears in our data fidelity term now has this weighting with the uh, sensitivities of the receiver coils, and then uh, after that, applying the Fourier transform. Additionally, you can also apply the subsampling uh, operator that only selects, for example, every second or every fourth line in the case space. Then the overall formulation again looks like this. You see, again, a compact model, total version regularization. This A operator models our physics, and we get the solution by minimizing with respect to U. If we wouldn't regularize, then the result would look like this, and this is how the MRI looks like if you regularize it by means of total version. Of course, nowadays we applied some machine learning to replace the total version with uh, a prior that is much better 
and has been learned on, on, on thousands of different MRI images, and then the results look much better. But this is just to show that this very simple model can be used to replace something that looks like this with something that looks like that. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how many, how much time I think I'm already at the end, right? So maybe I... Yeah, <laughs> 50 minutes. No, I think I have many different applications which you can sort of like here, 3D reconstruction, uh, shape from focus, and you can all solve them with this model. But maybe I should jump back to the conclusion. The last thing was optical flow. So what I try to talk to you is about statistical modeling and Bayesian inference, which consists of modeling the prior and the likelihood. And I have motivated something that is called the total variation regularizer, which is a simple model, but is quite versatile. You can apply it to many different problems in, in uh, image restoration, medical imaging, 3D room structure, and so forth. So you can generalize it to higher order smoothness, color images, and numerical optimization is, is usually done with primary dual algorithms. It's a very flexible model. This is the takeaway to solve many problems in computer vision and image processing. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.